We are continuing our study in John chapter 12 of the Gospel of John, and we are specifically in that chapter. I want you to consider some of the weeks that we have had prior to this particular lesson, especially if you have been in charge of scripture reading. Sometimes I have hand handed you a piece of paper that was full of scriptures. Sometimes I've handed you two pieces of paper that were full of scriptures. Some of our scripture readers, at least one of them, was handed a piece of paper where there were five pieces of paper with scripture on it. So we have had lessons that covered 20 verses of scripture, 30 verses of scripture, and more. But this morning we're only going to take a look at seven. We're just going to take a look at seven verses of scripture from John chapter 12. And I want to tell you a little bit about how this particular sermon is going to be laid out because it's going to be a little bit different than some of the others. Some of the other lessons that we look at from an expository standpoint, we try to figure out just exactly what the lesson is talking about from God's perspective. But at the same time, this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to realize 313. That's what I want you to focus on this morning. 313. Because out of these seven verses of Scripture, the first three really serve as our introduction. They are what kind of give us the idea of what's going on and what's about to happen. Then we have, right at the core of those seven verses of Scripture, we have a statement that Jesus makes about what is about to take place. And then we see how that is manifested in the following three verses. And so this morning, I hope you are in John chapter 12, verses 20 through 26, because we're going to go there. But as I tell my students in the school of preaching, I say, don't make your audience lazy. Don't help the congregation to be lazy. What do I mean by that? I tell them, I say, don't put everything up on the PowerPoint to where they sit back like in a movie theater and they just kind of get entertained. I said, they need to work, they need to be involved, and they need to be looking up these scriptures. But unlike most lessons that I preach, I'm going to tell you right now, all seven of these verses are going to be up on the PowerPoint in their entirety. And we're going to begin with those first three verses of scripture. We're going to take a look at John chapter 12, verses 20, 21, and 22. John chapter 12, verses 20, 21, and 22. And we read, now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These people then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and were making a request of him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. Now that is really our introduction. And right off the bat, we find somebody by the name of Philip here. We've talked about Philip before, how he is from Bethsaida. In fact, in John chapter 1 and verse 44, we've got a, an error on the PowerPoint, but in John 1 and verse 44, we've already been introduced to Philip, we've been introduced to Bethsaida, and we've also found out that that is the home of Andrew and Peter. That's what it reads. Now Philip from Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. So we see and we talked about early on this particular city and how it was in the northern part of Galilee, a place that Jesus frequented. It was one of his hubs of his ministry and a place where he visited often. It is at this place that suddenly we find some Greeks coming looking for Jesus. Now, this is what's very interesting, because what is a Greek? We would say, well, isn't that someone from Greece? Well, that would be true. But from a biblical standpoint, the Greeks were something else, especially from a Jewish standpoint. If we take a look at the word Gentile and we ask, what is the definition of a Gentile? We know from a biblical standpoint that a Gentile is anybody who's not a Jew. Well, if you ask what is a Jew, that is somebody who came from the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So you have the Jews and the Gentiles, and that encompasses everybody. That is the entirety of the world. There is no one else beyond Jews and Gentiles from a biblical standpoint. And so when we see the word Gentile, we usually understand that, but the word Greek is often associated in the same vein. Some of your translations will use the word Gentile in various passages of Scripture, while other translations will use the word Greek. But the idea was that a Greek to the Jew was a foreigner, 
someone outside of the nation of Israel, someone who probably and possibly practiced some kind of pagan worship not associated with biblical teachings and not associated with the God of the universe. And so this would be the term. And so we see these Greeks coming up. The Bible uses this terminology a lot, for instance. Let me give you several examples there. In John chapter 7, verses 34 and 35, a passage of Scripture we've already talked about where Jesus said, You will seek me and will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. The Jews, in verse 35, then said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? They asked the question, where can he possibly hide? We know where everybody is. We know where there's just no place he could go. We couldn't find him. And then they throw out this caveat. They said, he is not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? Where's the one place the Jews wouldn't be? In the midst of the Greeks. Where would the one place the Jews wouldn't be? In the midst of the Gentiles. They tried to separate themselves from foreign people. And so... We see this terminology used there. Uh, Paul the Apostle, who was born and raised a Jew, not only genetically but religiously, before his convert to conversion to Christianity, he was a Jew and he would speak in this regard. And he said in several passages to the church at Rome, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So the gospel is the power to save everyone. And if you want to divide everyone into two categories, you've got the Jews and the Greeks. In Romans 2 and verse 9, we read, There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. So not only can the gospel save everyone, Jew and Greek alike, but our sins will condemn everyone without the salvation that is brought to us through the gospel. That's everyone, both Jew and Greek. In Romans chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, Paul asks the question, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. So in this passage of Scripture, we see that both Jews and Greeks alike cannot save themselves. They're all under the condemnation of sin, and they're all in need of the salvation that is given to us, that is granted to us by the grace and mercy of God, and the forgiveness of sins granted to us by the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. But why would Greeks, if Greeks are foreigners, if Greeks are pagans, if Greeks are those people who had so little in common with the Jews, why would they make their way to where a bunch of Jews were and in the center of that attention, their teacher, their Messiah, their Savior, their King, why would they come and want to talk to him? It's very interesting. Albert Barnes, the great commentator, made the following observations. He says, if we're going to figure out why they're here, he said, I can figure out only three reasons for which these foreigners, these Greeks, would want to see Jesus. Number one, he writes that they were Jews who spoke the Greek language and dwelt in some of the Greek cities. It is known that Jews were scattered in Asia Minor, Greece, Macedonia, Egypt, in all places which had synagogues. So perhaps these were Jews but by referencing them as Greeks, they're simply talking about those are the people who speak Greek. So that's one possibility. The second possibility as to who these Greeks were was that, number two, they were proselytes from amongst the Greeks. In other words, they were converts to Judaism. So they were born Gentiles. They were born outside of the nation of Israel, but they converted to the Jude Judeo faith. Okay, that's one option. Then number three, that they were still Gentiles and idolaters. Now that third option, as soon as I read that part, I'm going, that doesn't explain anything to me. Why in the world would pagan foreigners come into the land of promise seeking out Jesus? Well, Mr. Barnes goes on to comment. He said, they were still Gentiles and idolaters who came to bring offerings to Yahweh to be deposited in the temple. At that point, I'm more confused. Uh, 
He said, one writer has shown that the surrounding pagans were accustomed not only to send presents, sacrifices, and offerings to the temple, but that they also frequently attended the great feasts of the Jews. Hence, the outer court of the temple was called the court of the Gentiles. I guess probably the thing that I would almost liken that to is to people today. People today who maybe have no faith in God, people today who do not claim to be religious in any shape or form, but they enjoy religious holidays, they take advantage of religious feasts, uh, they enjoy those kinds of activities, maybe the, the traveling that it might involve, maybe the presence that might uh, uh, be a part of those kinds of things. But the bottom line is these were truly idolatrous Gentiles who were visiting even to the point to give gifts to the temple. Well, whatever the case, we're not exactly sure just exactly how to read that, but that gives us the introduction to what we're going to talk about this morning. And the introduction is found in that center verse out of these seven verses of Scripture. And we're going to call this morning's lesson which comes really from that center verse and the three verses following, we're going to talk about this lesson and entitle it, Some Greeks Seek Jesus. That's kind of a bland title, though. So we're going to explore that just a little deeper, and we're going to try to get a little closer to the heart of the matter, and we're going to talk about how this really is all about the glorification of Jesus, how Jesus would be and is today glorified as the Lord. So let's take a look at John chapter 12, and we're going to start by asking this first question, first of three, and this is, comes out of John chapter 12, verse 23, where Jesus answered them by saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now in that statement, Jesus is saying the time has come. The, he, when he says the hour has come, He's saying it's time. That's our modern day lingo. It's time for something to happen. And the something that is going to happen is that Jesus is going to be glorified. Now, we have the blessing of 2020 hindsight. We realize that Jesus is now in the last week of his life before his crucifixion on the cross. So we know what's right around the corner. We know what's about to happen to him. And so that makes sense. But when he says this is the time that I'm going to be glorified, he then helps us to understand some things. We read in John chapter 7, verse 39, a passage of Scripture that we've already looked at before, that the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And yet, in John 12 and verse 16, something we read just last week, in the future, the things that the disciples did not understand at this moment in time, they would understand later after he was glorified. So we know the time frame of exactly what Jesus is talking about here. He is about to die on the cross, and how would that be glorifying? Because he would be completing his purpose, he would be fulfilling the will of his Father, and he would shed his blood to save us from our sins. That is the glory that he would behold just days away. So that brings us to that first of three questions, and it comes out of John chapter 12 and verse 24. How was Jesus glorified? How was, past tense, he glorified? Let's take a look at that verse of Scripture where some of your translations will say, Verily, verily, that's a, just a, uh, an old, or a King James Version way of saying truly, truly, or this is a very important truth that I'm about to declare. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. I want you to consider the first part of that passage of Scripture. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. Take a seed, any seed, and set it aside just on the, on the podium there, on the ground, on, on asphalt or something like that. Uh, put it on your desk. Put it in your hand. It's just going to stay there, and it's going to stay alone. Nothing's going to happen. But plant that seed in the ground, 
And what happens is it grows. It grows because first it dies. Now that's a kind of a strange saying for those of us who are not in the agricultural industry. But what happens is the composition of that seed breaks down. It deteriorates. But then it is left with that germ, that spark of life that God has placed within it. And it is from that, that life that that seed then starts to grow. It starts to germinate. And it starts to become what it was always intended to be. I want you to consider Jesus for just a moment in that same way. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, we read, But we do, not, we do see him who, made for a little while, who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Jesus died so that everyone else would not have to. He died so that we could live. This was his moment of glory. We also read in verse 10 of Hebrews chapter 2 how that glory then spreads to us if we do his will. For it was fitting for him, we read, for whom are all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their, their salvation through sufferings. It was Jesus' purpose to suffer. It was Jesus' purpose to, lie, to die on that cross. But it was also Jesus' purpose to rise again, just like a seed that is planted in the ground. He would rise again to live again and bring about the fruit of his great deed. I included up here a passage from Luke chapter 23, verses 43 through 46. This is the passage of scripture where Jesus is literally hanging on the cross. He's got two thieves on either side of him. Both of them have hurled insults at him prior to this point. But at one point in time, one of them changes his mind. He changes his heart. He repents of what he has said before, and he realizes Jesus is the king. He is the Messiah, and he asks Jesus to remember him when he comes in his kingdom. Jesus would say in Luke chapter 23 and verse 43, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. And we read it was now about the sixth hour, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour, because the sun was obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Very important. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now this is important because Jesus breathed his last, which means his life ended. His body was then buried in a tomb. But his spirit continued on and not only went to, into the hands of the Father, but very specifically we are told where he would be that very day. He would be with that thief in paradise, something that is a part of what is called Hades or the Hadean realm, which means the place of departed spirits. And so as Jesus' spirit left, everything else ended. His life ended. His body ended. And at the end of all of that... He was put in the tomb. But that spark of life, that germ, if you would, in a comparative sense to what Jesus says here, was still alive. And it was that that would come back and reanimate that body and give life again so that he could rise from that tomb, demonstrating his power over life and death. His ability to grant us that same opportunity through the gospel. Jesus was glorified when he died on that cross, was buried in that tomb, and rose again. But now what I want us to do is I want us to ask a little bit different question. It's almost the same, but there's just one word difference. And that is, how is Jesus glorified? Jesus talked about how he would be glorified in John chapter 12 and verse 25 to first century hearers. But what is amazing is how applicable it is to 21st century hearers as well. Because we too can glorify Jesus 
in the following ways. Number one, let's take a look at this verse of Scripture. It reads, the one who loves his life loses it, and the one who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. I've included a couple of passages of scriptures, one from Matthew and one from Luke, that will help us to understand this kind of talk, this kind of discussion, because Jesus would often talk about things in opposites. If you want to go this way, then you need to go this way. If you want to accomplish this, then you need to accomplish this. And there was wisdom behind his words because he wanted people to think and he wanted them to understand just exactly what he was saying, not be able to just simply memorize and quote what he said, but to really understand it so that it would make application to their lives and to those that they would share this message with as well. But it is in this passage of scripture, and we'll take a look at the first one from the book of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 39, we get a glimpse of some of this opposite language. Jesus said, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Well, I thought Jesus was the prince of peace. Just a couple of Wednesday nights ago on our live stream, we talked about Jesus Christ, the prince of division. And I remember looking into the camera and saying to any that were watching, said, you weren't expecting that, were you? You expected the Prince of Peace. After all, it was foretold that he would be the Prince of Peace. Uh, we see the angel telling the, the shepherds that, that this is the person uh, who is going to bring peace to all men, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. But division? Is that really who our Savior is? That's who he said he was. He said, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. Verse 35, for I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be the members of, its, of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Yes, truth is hard to understand, to fathom, to accept, and that's especially true in families sometimes. That truth will divide that which is considered to be by some the closest bond, the strongest bond. After all, is that not what they say? Blood is thicker than water. And yet Jesus would make the point that his truth would divide even the bloodlines. You continue on in verses 38 and 39 of Matthew 10. And Jesus says, he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. That sounds very much like what he's talking about in John chapter 12 and verse 25. The idea that in this world, in this existence, while I am alive and in the flesh, if my focus is only on me, if my focus is only on my happiness and, and what I can get and how much money I can make and how popular I can be with other people and how much fun I can just have day after day after day, if it's all about me, the biblical principle says live it up then because that life's going to end. And when that life ends, you're going to face eternal death cast out of the presence of God. But... If you lose your life in this world, not talking about the loss of physical life, but we're talking about self-sacrifice. We're talking about not selfishness, but selflessness. If you die to self and live for Jesus, then that death to self will be rewarded not only in this life, but in the eternal life to come. But the question is, are we willing to die to self. That's the key to it all. In Luke chapter 9 verses 23 through 26, Jesus was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross. And then Dr. Luke says something that the other gospel writers do not say. He says to take up your cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. Now Luke goes on to say, and to ask this question, for what is a man profited if he gains his own world, uh, the, the whole world, and loses or forfeits himself? 
Some gospel accounts and other translations will say, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Now remember, the soul in this case is not talking about the eternal aspect of man. That's the spirit. The word soul here means life. And although spirit would make a lot of sense, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his eternal salvation? That makes sense to us. What Jesus is actually asking here is, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? He gains everything in the world, all its riches, all its resources, all its popularity, all its knowledge, all of its understanding. What if a man gains his whole, the whole world and is dead? What does it profit a man? Well, of course, absolutely nothing. We like to ask that question, how many of you have ever seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul? That's because where that hearse is headed, or at least where that person who has passed is headed, is nowhere where he can bring the property or the things of this life. And so, what we want to do in this world is die to self. What we want to do in this world is to lose our lives for the sake of Christ, to, to quite literally uh, hate the world so that we can give our full love and attention to the Savior. Luke would say in one final verse in Luke chapter 9 and verse 26, he would say, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. If we want to be a part of that glory, we don't want to be ashamed of Jesus. If we want to be a part of that glory, we don't want to be too, so proud that we only think of ourselves. If we want to be a part of that glory, then we need to live a life of self-sacrifice and service to Jesus. Now focus on that last word, their service, because that brings us to the next question. Once again, we're going to ask a question different from the first question, but was identical to that last question. How else, how is Jesus glorified? And once again, the, verse, the answer is going to come right out of John chapter 12 and verse 26, when Jesus would continue to talk about service. And he would say, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Think about that for just a moment. Two times the word serves is used there. One time the word servant is used. And the idea is if we accomplish this, the Father will honor the person who serves in this capacity. There are a lot of different verses that I have up on the board. The first one is out of Luke chapter 9 and verse 59 through 60. And I want to share with you several passages of Scripture where Jesus talked about or gave the instruction to follow me. The first is there in Luke chapter 9 verses 59 through 60 where Jesus is calling on a lot of people to follow him. But several of these people seem to be making excuses. And so as a result, he said to another, follow me, but that fellow... That person said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 21 and 22, we've got a little snippet of the story of the rich young ruler. And you remember this was the young man who came wanting to know more about eternal life and and, and what's important for him to do. And, and when Jesus talks to him, the young man basically justifies himself by telling all of the good deeds he had accomplished in life. But Jesus knew his heart. Jesus knew his love for money. Jesus knew his love for his possessions. And so as a result, Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. Now I want you to think about that for just a second. In the first illustration, you've got a guy making excuses. In the second illustration, you've got a guy who's not really true fully to the service to which he's committed. You've got people who understand the words, follow me, but even say they want to follow him but they don't have the follow-through. They don't have the rest of the story. 
uh, justified or backed up in their actions and their deeds. But if you remember one of the very first verses, really, one of the very first encounters we have of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, this is a time where Jesus first encounters Peter and Andrew, brothers, fishermen. And he says to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Now here's what's interesting. They didn't make excuses. They didn't have something else that was more important to them than following Jesus. We read in verse 18, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Immediately they dropped what they were doing because following after him, listening to him, learning his teaching so that they could obey it more fully was more important to them than anything else. In this passage of scripture from John chapter 12 and verse 26, in addition to the service aspect of it, at the very end of the passage of scripture, Jesus says, if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Just before that, he says, that where I am, there my servant will be also. Well, where would Jesus be? Where is he now? How will he honor me? And where will I be with the Father to receive this honor? That, of course, is in heaven. And this, of course, is mindful, at least to me, of John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, where just two chapters from now, where Jesus is preparing his disciples for his exit from this world, where he will go back to heaven, be at the right hand of the Father, and where he makes them a promise. He said to them, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I come again, I come again to receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. You see, Jesus is preparing that place for us once right now. And when he comes back, he wants those who have truly been his disciples, those who have sacrificed self and served him, he wants them to be glorified in the same way that he has been glorified through obedience to the Father's will. I want you to consider that day what will Jesus behold in this world? What will Jesus behold in my life? What will Jesus behold in your life? Will he be glorified by how we have chosen to live? Or will he be rejected because we wanted to do what we wanted to do more than we wanted to do what he wanted us to do? I take you to the another passage of scripture from John chapter 17 and verse 24. And it's in this passage of scripture that Jesus is involved in his very famous prayer. And, and in five chapters, we'll study this prayer more completely. But Jesus in John 17 and verse 24 says, Father, I desire that they also, and these are his disciples, these are those who have sacrificed self and served him, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. The Son was loved by the Father before anything was even created. And he loved him for numerous ways, but he loved him for what he was willing to do and for what he sent him to do here on this earth. Because just as much as he knew in his omniscient, all-knowing mind what Jesus would do on that cross for us, he knew it before any of us were ever born, before man was cre even created. He knew that his creation would fall. He knew his creation would rebel against his wishes and need that salvation from that eternal condemnation that we deserve. Jesus was glorified in his sacrifice. He wants us to glorify him in our sacrifice. He wants us to glorify him in our service. And in so doing, we will be exalted. We will be glorified. Not as equals with God, not as equals with our Lord. But we will be glorified by receiving something we don't deserve, and that's heaven. By not receiving something we do deserve, and that's hell. He will glorify us by taking us home where we can live with him forever. Where are you this morning? What kind of life are you living?
If it is a life of selfishness, then the sacrifice of Jesus is in vain to you. But if you realize the great sacrifice that Jesus gave when he sacrificed his life for ours, when he paid the price for our sin, the only price that could be paid and have those sins washed away in the waters of baptism, washed away in the blood of the Lamb. If you realize what he's done for you and you're outside of Christ this morning, why don't you come in contact with the blood of the Lamb? Be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and have your sins washed away. If you are a child of God, continue that life of self-sacrifice and service. Continue that life that says, Jesus, you are more important than I am. That has always been and that will forevermore be. But I am so happy that you are my Savior. I'm so happy that you paid that price. And I will live for you in this life so that I can live with you forever and ever. Where are you this morning? What's your decision? Are you glorifying Jesus? Think about that question. All together, we stand and sing.